So, uh, Shandi and Kirsten here are going to give us their presentations on their senior theses. Um, Shandi, I forgot my bio, so I'm going to pull those back up. Okay. But um, we're going to allow more time for you guys to have a conversation with them. Um, they're going to, I'm going to give them more time to talk since they're only two panelists as opposed to three or four as some other panels have. Um, I want to start a little bit by introducing myself and then give them right over to their presentation so they can wow you with their research. Uh, I'm David Blanding. I'm a PhD candidate in the Department of Political Science. Um, I also facilitated the Theories in Action Conference last year, so I'm looking forward to what these two women have for us today. Um, let me just briefly introduce them. Shani, as I said, is an education concentrator, um, and so her work that she's about to present is really about um, the research she did while she, while she was in the Virgin Islands, which is where she's originally from. Um, and uh, in addition to being an education concentrator and a fabulous researcher on education in the Virgin Islands, um, Shani is also incredibly active at Brown. So she's in the Word Poetry Group, she's on the women's rugby team, and she's a Royce Fellow. Um, and not to be outdone, uh, Kristen is a history of art and architecture concentrator who had a great internship at the Real Rhode Island School of Design Museum this past semester, um, which was the impetus for the research she's going to present to you today. And so without further ado, I'll hand it over to these two. Shani, I'll let you start first, and then Kirsten um, can start up afterwards. So good afternoon. Thank you for coming. Um, so I just want to do a sort of brief presentation on my capstone project in education, um, titled Education in the Virgin Islands Purpose Practice Progress. So just to sort of give you an idea of what we're talking about, um, I am from St. Croix in the US Virgin Islands. It's a tiny island over there near Puerto Rico. Um, and there is a picture um, at my friend's house. So. You know, I live someplace absolutely wonderful. Um, this, I just want to uh, do a little bit, you know, about me. So um, I'm Afro Caribbean West Indian. My entire family, both sides, are from the Caribbean. My mom's family um, is from Trinidad and Guyana. My father's family is Jamaican. Um, I was raised in Saint Croix. Um, my parents are both first gen American. Um, and I'm interested in sort of community engagement, social justice, and education. Um, and those sort of, uh, I became interested in those in high school, um, and I sort of will elaborate more on how those are part of my high school experience and how that led me to be an education concentrator around a little bit later. Um, some facts about the U.S. Virgin Islands. Um, we're actually a U.S. Co uh, colony. Um, they also call us like territories, commonwealths, non-self-governing territories. There are lots of um, names. There are three islands, St. Croix, St. Thomas, and St. John. Um, they were acquired by the U.S. in 1917. Um, they say there are seven flags, but we like, I like to say that there are eight. Um, the islands have been inhabited by uh, native Virgin Islanders, um, the Sabone, Arawak, and Carib Indians. Um, the Spanish, French, Dutch, British, Knights of Malta, Danish, and finally uh, the U.S. So there have been a lot of different cultural influences happening um, in the Virgin Islands since 1493 when Columbus landed on St. Croix. Um, the Big Island St. Croix where I'm from is a population of about 50,000 people. Um, in total there are about 110,000 people. Um, it's really diverse. The, most of the population is Afro-Caribbean, it's about 70%, um, and then it's about 14% Puerto Rican and 11% white. Um, and so a lot of those people are native Virgin Islanders or their families have been there um, for a number of generations. There are also always a lot of new people coming in. So my abstract, um, it's changed a lot over the course of doing the project. Um, as David mentioned, I'm a 2011 Royce Fellow and I went in with a project, you have to do a proposal and it's based on the research and, and the things that were available to me, my abstract has changed a lot. Um, and this is sort of the final one. Uh, it's a snapshot of how political and economic dynamics and social identities both shape and are shaped by our system of education impacting the well-being of the Virgin Islands and its people today. Um, so that's pretty much what I'm working with and pretty much what I'm, I'm gonna um, sort of talk about briefly today. So in terms of my research, um, I said I'd talk about you know, my high school experience. Um, there are two really uh, important 
things that I participated in when I was in high school, and one was an improv group. Um, and we did a lot of community work around um, health, relationships, family, um, things that were really geared towards youth. We would do poetry and skits and go into different schools and do a lot of different um, educational programs. And so um, that was a peer educator experience. And then I was also, uh, I worked on the teen hotline, which was sort of a, an anonymous um, advice counseling resource hotline. Um, so I worked there for three years as part of um, my service. And so those allowed me to really interact with a lot of different people and learn about their lives and what they were dealing with outside of you know my own social circles or what I may have been able to access if I had only dealt with you know people that I went to school and played sports with so it really allowed me to really get a more holistic view of even you know the the life on on St. Croix and, and what a greater idea of what 50,000 people experience um, so I was really interested in, in a qualitative approach to this. I really wanted to know not just about the numbers and, and how things have changed over time and statistics, but I wanted to know what people felt about it. I wanted to know um, how those changes affected us socially um, and, and what, how that was perceived. And then from those interviews, um, I was able to find literature. Um, it's really hard. Really, the only people that study Virgin Islanders are Virgin Islanders. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of information. You just have to dig around and find it. Um, in terms of interviews, I interviewed a number of youth educators. So people who were professors at the university, um, teachers, health resources, um, sort of on the micro scale in terms of, of doing things like Planned Parenthood and on the macro scale of um, people who are really into like social justice. For instance, I was able to interview um, Dr. Gloria Joseph, who is uh, Audre Lorde's partner. So um, that was really interesting, and I was, it was really um, great to be able to interact with all these people who um, had devoted their lives and careers to learning about what it meant for us to be Virgin Islanders. So in terms of, of trying to figure out how to relate these ideas, um, it was, the project started out as a timeline. I was gonna do sort of 1960s to now, like linear, what, what, are we, what are we talking about? What are we looking at in terms of social changes, political changes, economic changes, educational changes? Um, and as I got into it, I found that it wasn't gonna work that way. It was gonna be more of a web. Um, there were so many different facets to life and, and interactions and, and context. Um, and so if you talk about one subject, then you talk about 10 different subjects. Um, so it turned into more of a web. Um, and that sort of reminded me of a tradition that is really common among a lot of different cultures, which is storytelling. Um, how do you relay a history? How do you um, give a dynamic telling of a people um, that are so diverse and, and exist in so many ways? Um, and so I chose you know, to think about it in that sense. Um, today I'm going to give sort of like one strand of that story, something that's you know really easy to, to hold on to. Um, so in terms of, of ideas that I've come across, um, in terms of my interviews, but then also some of the history books about um, the Virgin Islands, there's actually one really important um, text written in 1995 by Harold Willicks called The Umbilical Cord, and it's a... Um, pretty much the, the comprehensive text on the Virgin Islands, dealing from pre-colonial his, pre -colonial history to the present. Um, so part of what we found was that in the 1960s, there were a lot of really huge infrastructural changes. Um, even though the Virgin Islands was acquired by the United States in the 1917, they really didn't take an interest in us until the 50s and 60s um, as sort of a military base, as um, you know, a place where commerce could happen, where an industry could happen. So in the 1960s, two big changes that happened were um, the teacher certification policy. Um, the US was going through a lot of educational reform at the time. Um, they were talking about you know, teachers and really sort of implementing like Dewey and ideas, and, and Frere was talking um, about education at that point. And so they were doing a lot of change um, in terms of curriculum and how education would happen. Um, and we like to say that uh, when the United States sneezes, we get pneumonia. <laughs> because when a change happens in a large scale um, and it happens on a small scale with a smaller group of people, it's so much more drastic. So there's a teacher certification policy. There's also the Hess oil refinery. If any of you know the Hess gas stations, the refinery for um, that company is located in the Virgin Islands um, on St. Croix. 
and it was established in 1965. It's on the South Shore. It's about seven square miles. Um, to give you an idea of how large it is, uh, the island is about 84 square miles, so it covers about 12% of the South Shore. Um, it's very, very large, and it was established as part of a deal um, between the governor and the president um, as part of this whole economic development like plan. Um, but the caveat is that the governors were appointed until the 70s. And so there really was no input from the Virgin Islanders about things like something that was going to take up seven square miles of the island um, and a number of other you know, industries. Alcoa, the aluminum company, is right next door. So that's huge. Um, and there were a lot of changes happening there that Virgin Islands really didn't have a say in. So back to you know these two things. These two uh, yielded some really interesting and drastic repercussions. Over the next decade, um, in relation to the teacher certification policy, pushed a lot of native Virgin Islanders out of um, the teaching profession um, because it required that teachers had to be certified um, and go to college and get a certificate in teaching. Um, and a lot of these teachers had been doing it their whole lives. This was their career. This is what they had done. Um, you know, they were educated, but not in the sense that the United States wanted them to be educated. And so many of the older teachers who were sort of bringing up the younger teachers left. Um, they were like, well, why would we you know, go to the States or go to Puerto Rico and go to college all over again just to come back and teach and retire in like five years. It didn't make any sense to them. Um, and so to replace that dearth of teachers, they sent in a lot of American teachers. Um, but there was no understanding of culture um, and what it meant to be a Virgin Islander. And so there was a really big disconnect between the students and the teachers and also within the community. Um, and in terms of the refinery, there was a huge population boom and a demographic shift. So over the next decade, the population doubled from about 33,000 to almost 60,000. And then in five years, it halved again. So it was almost up to 75 or 80,000 people. Um, with that population boom, there was also a demographic shift. So a lot of people came from other islands. Um, and although a lot of Caribbean culture is similar in terms of um, food and language and things like that, there are still different histories. You have French, Spanish, Dutch, English islands um, and that all have their own context. And so you have all these cultures coming in. Um, and that created a lot of social tension um, because the infrastructure wasn't built for that many people. And it happened so quickly that it wasn't able to adjust. Um, also, in terms of sort of social um, tension, a lot of these people were coming in to work at the refinery and to work at Alcoa. Um, but because Virgin Islanders didn't really have a say in what was happening, that sort of misguided um, or misplaced anger and resentment was uh, placed upon a lot of people from other islands. So where they would have been able to maybe find um, commonalities or you know, embrace other people, um, there was a, a really big um, sort of disconnect there. So in terms of outcomes, um, there were a lot of really big uh, things that, that happened over the next 40 years. There was a lot of attrition. So because um, teachers were coming into classrooms and, for instance, telling students that they didn't speak um, proper English and that their language was broken, or you know that uh, there wasn't a relaying of culture or anything like that in the classrooms, there was a lot of attrition. So a lot of students um, left school, and over time, there was a lot of less engagement in skilled labor um, and a lot less uh, going to college and higher education. So, um, for example, the national rate of, of college attendance is about 30%. For us, it's about 16. So it's a little bit less than half, a little bit more than half. Um, and then, of course, the social repercussions I talked about in terms of community and what that meant and how that changed. Um, there was a lot of tension there. And then, of course, brain drain. Um, because there was so much tension and so much instability, a lot of people who did leave ended up staying in the States or staying in other islands um, because they felt that you know, they wouldn't be able to succeed if they came back home. Um, so that was really sort of a struggle. Also, um, a really important infrastructural like upheaval was uh, back in 89, there was a hurricane um, that damaged about 95% of the island. Um, millions of dollars of damage um, took homes and, and schools and basically wiped out everything. And so even though um, they had to build from scratch, there was still sort of like patchwork um, rebuilding. 
So in terms of progress, after we look at all of the struggles and all of the, the different contexts and histories that have happened in the past 50 years, this rapid, rapid change, um, how do we move forward? How do we sort of change this and, and create a system that will benefit Virgin Islanders um, holistically? We have to think about new models, so new models of education, also new models of, of government. Um, if you're thinking about a system of education that also is connected to you know, the health systems and economic systems and all these other things, and so you can't just change it in one area, you have to change it in all areas. Um, and so those changes have to come gradually and over time, but we do need new models. Um, in terms of new programs, we have to remember that education happens in school and out of school, formally and informally. So what can we do in school and what can we do out of school that will help students um, be able to be successful? And then, of course, new policies. Um, our policies are really outdated, but also we don't have our own constitution. There is a limit to our ability to self-determine. Um, we have the Organic Act but that limits how we contact other countries, how we do commerce, um, and how we sort of govern ourselves. And so a really important part of progress would be um, a change in policy. In terms of goals, um, I think it's important to sort of define what I think education is. Um, because ultimately this project is something that I'm engaging in from my point of view, um, but in order for it to be sort of used or put in action at all, um, it has to be something that is done throughout the community, something that everyone engages in, um, and so it's important for me to know where my standpoint is and also be able to relate to other people. Um, and education for me is not just about academic skills, but also about socialization and identity and value building. Um, if we have a faltering, faltering public education system in the context of ongoing colonialism, then there are going to be social and psychological repercussions on our sense of self-determination and our vision of what kind of future we can build. Um, we need an education, I think, that speaks to who we are, one that includes Caribbean history and literature and instills a sense of pride in who we are rather than a longing to be who we are not. Um, I think that, you know, it's kind of important to note that I was sort of spurred into this project my freshman year taking Caribbean literature at Brown. And it was, it seemed ironic to me that, you know, I was 18 and this was the first time that I was taking Caribbean literature and I grew up in the Caribbean, my whole family's from the Caribbean. Um, and yet I had to wait till I came to college 2,000 miles away um, to do that and engage in that. So by understanding what sort of events and interactions engender our struggles today, I hope that we can begin to reform our sense of what we want being Virgin Islanders to mean and having our actions and especially our educational structures reflect that desire in, courting, um, in order to encourage young people to step up um, and lead and not you know, sort of abandon um, our home. So you know, these are the really um, the, the assumptions that I'm basing my project on and, and the goals that I hope um, we'll be able to engage in and spur that conversation. Um, we need a dynamic education, one that's as um, sort of changeable and, and, and um, you know, dynamic as we are. And so I think that um, that's really important. Thank you. Am I allowed to sit? That's no problem. Okay, cool. All right, well, you want me to... Um, I think if I just sit there, that'll be fine. <laughs> well, first of all, thank you everybody for coming. Um, hopefully I won't trip over that cord. Um, so as you can see, um, put this into slideshow mode. Um, um, so as you can see, and as David already mentioned, my senior capstone project has been about art conservation, specifically as it's practiced at the RISD Museum. Uh, hopefully some of you guys have been there because it's right down the hill. Um, so what initially sparked my interest in this field was a course I took this past fall at RISD called the Art, art Conservation. Um, I signed up as an art history concentrator looking for a practical application of my academic interests. And besides that, I've always just been interested in the educational mission of museums, bringing art to the public. And I really wanted to see how that works behind the scenes. Um, the class, which was taught by the head conservator of the museum, Ingrid <coughs> Newman, um, was geared primarily toward practicing artists, i.e. RISD students. Um, so it highlighted materials, media, a lot of how to make your work last over time, 
Um, and I've done some studio art, so that wasn't so foreign to me, but it, I was also intrigued by the profession of conservation itself. Um, and this on the right, which is kind of blurry and dark, but um, that's a photo from the class when we practiced making storage boxes using conservation grade materials. Um, so after the class was over, I asked to do an internship in the spring with Ingrid which isn't uncommon at all for her. Um, she's had both RISD and Brown students as interns in the past. And here I am cleaning a mosaic on my very first day in the ancient gallery. Um, and I'll note that Ingrid is technically an objects conservator, which means she works specifically um, on sculpture, furniture, really anything three-dimensional. But because she is the head conservator, she works on everything in the museum to some extent. Um, and in order to receive academic credit and to turn the internship into a capstone project, I opted to organize a, an independent study um, with Professor Stephen Lubar, um, who's the head of Brown's Public Humanities Program, um, which is a master's program based at the John Nicholas Brown Center, which that's what that is. Um, and it's also related to the undergraduate AMSIV, or I think they call it the American Studies Program now. Um, so the conceit is that I would work as an intern on a weekly basis while simultaneously finding my way into the theoretical literature of conservation. Um, some texts were recommended by Ingrid, some by Professor Lubar, and some I found on my own. Um, now part of the reason I applied to present at this conference in the first place was that my project seemed to appropriate to the theme of theories in action, um, as it's literally half reading, half doing. Um, for the sake of my presentation, it seemed a little more exact to say um, that this combination is principles and execution. Even though I went about studying the two at the same time, um, I thought it made the most sense to give you an overview of the principles first in order to put what I've actually done at the museum into context. Um, so the first book that I read for the independent study was Chris Capel's Conservation Skills, Judgment, Method, and Decision Making. Um, and I picked this book as a continuation of the excerpts that we had read during the course at RISD. Um, and I went in expecting a practical textbook, but actually it's much more abstract consideration of the field. Um, first of all, Capel really wants to consider the psychological motivation of why we preserve anything in a museum, um, suggesting that we do that because objects are the nearest thing we have to an objective past. Um, it's all about having a tangible history. Um, he also provides a brief history of the field of conservation from its craft origins and 19th century refinement as an actual profession to today's engagement with scientific research and that sort of thing. Um, his main point, though, is that while the practice of conservation is essentially a series of judgments and decisions, it's the conservator's responsibility to remain as objective as possible and to respect the integrity of the object being treated. Right. The next major text I read was Barbara Applebaum's Conservation Treatment Methodology, which came on Professor Lubar's re recommendation. Um, and even though Applebaum has been a practicing conservator herself for many years, this book is meant as a primer in conservation theory for mu museum professionals in other administrative areas, so curators, registrars, installers even, or even for the public. Um, her approach is not unlike Capel in that she stresses carefully considered decision making using models like a characterization grid for objects. Um, which balances the conservator's attention to both the material and um, um, material, physical, and non-material intangible properties when choosing a treatment. Um, however, she gives a little more agency to the conservator by viewing treatment as an interpretive act. Um, conservators still need to do what's best for the object, but she acknowledges that that might lead to different decisions in different contexts. For instance, a fine arts conservator might attempt to restore an object's aesthetic integrity, while a conservator in a more anthropological setting, I usually use the Hoffman reference over on the uh, main green as an example, um, might want to leave, the, leave evidence of the object's use. Um, so finally, I came across, I'm gonna butcher this guy's name, but it's Salvador Munoz Vinas, um, Contemporary Theory of Conservation, while, con while researching the conservation of variable media as a specific subtopic in conservation. Um, 
he actually doesn't address the challenges of conserving new materials um, in contemporary art as I expected him to, but rather he redefines what he considers classical conservation theory, basically what Cable is advocating. Um, rather than treating the object as inviolable, um, he views conservation as an inherently subjective process, urging museum professionals to admit their authorship of the objects they treat and put on view in the museum, which I found to be a freeing but pretty radical perspective for conservators. Um, so just to sum up the literature, I think you can safely place these three authors on a spectrum in terms of their conceptions of the conservator's agency and treatment. Capel is pretty conservative. Um, emphasizing objectivity above all else. Munoz Vinas um, lies on the complete opposite end of subjectivity, and Applebaum falls somewhere in the middle. All right, so now that I've done the basic principles, let's see some pictures of what I've actually done. Um, so after reading Capel and Applebaum particularly, it wasn't all that surprising that I would wind up doing a lot of condition reporting which is assessing the state of objects for the sake of determining treatment or for insurance purposes. A lot of times it was objects that were going out on loan that had to be uh, reported on. Um, this impressionist painting um, was going into storage and in my report I noted cracks in the paint, um, brush hairs embedded in the paint that could be misinterpreted as damage, as well as missing gilding on the frame. One thing I've learned at the museum is that uh, oftentimes, the frame is just as important as the piece itself. All right. and cleaning has also been a big thing that I've been doing, and not just because I'm a lowly intern. Um, cleaning artworks has, can actually be pretty controversial because it's an irreversible process. Obviously, you can't put dirt back once it's been removed. Um, and reversibility of treatment is one of the major tenets of at least classical conservation theory. Generally, conservators don't want to permanently alter the object and insert themselves too much into the object on display. Um, and here we have Brian Chippendale's interactive inter installation sculpture, House on the Run, which was up until last month. Um, but we deinstalled it to make way for a new exhibit in the Contemporary Gallery. Um, after it was disassembled, Ingrid and I worked together and vacuumed out um, any dirt that was in there. Um, and consolidated any rips in the paper covering before it was packed and stored. Um, so this piece has been an ongoing project for a few weeks now, uh, and I wanted to highlight it because it combines a lot of the different components of conservation I've been doing all semester. Um, so it's a wooden devotional sculpture of St. Rock with his typical attribute, the dog offering bread. I think you can pretty much see that. Um, and it's definitely seen better days. It's filthy, it has insect damage, and it needs a lot of work before it's gonna go on view. Um, according to the museum records, it was acquired in 1921, but it's never been put on display. And right now we're working on cleaning and stabilizing the wood, and along the way we're assessing whether we should try to in-paint or fill in any of the colored areas that have chipped and or faded, which unfortunately you can't really see in the picture, but trust me, they're there. Um, Part of the problem with the paint that's left on the sculpture is that there are also patches of gilding that are more difficult to address. Basically, if we clean and impaint the flat colors in order to improve the aesthetics of the piece, the RISD Museum is, after all, a fine arts institution, um, we'll be left with only remnants of the gold, and that wouldn't be an honest rep representation of any true former state of the object. Conservators tend to aim for this elusive ideal state, and in this case, uh, it's a little more complicated to determine what that state entails. So to tie this back to the theoretical literature, I thought it would be interesting to think about how each of these three authors um, would approach this dilemma. Uh, returning to the spectrum of objectivity to subjectivity, I think Capel would probably recommend not in-painting in at all if that means we can't be true to the object. Whereas Applebaum might accept the in-painting and only consolidated gold areas as the conservator's interpretation of the object, as long as the conservator makes that intervention known, maybe in a caption with the object. Um, Munoz Vinas, on the other hand, would probably say yes to any treatment at all, as he would leave it entirely up to the conservator to decide how the object should look in this particular display. Um, and judging from Ingrid's own approach to this object, she seems to be steering a middle course. 
She's hesitant to do anything more radical than cleaning until she gets a clear idea of how the curator of the medieval department, where this will eventually go, um, wants to present this piece. Over the course of the semester, I've noticed that a lot of these decisions um, involve a collaboration of multiple museum specialists, so curators, registrars, etc. Um, so you get a lot of different opinions and perspectives, and every decision takes a very long time. Um, so now that I've had the opportunity to put theory into action or principles into execution, I've seen that it's all about defining context, which conveniently was the sort of buzzword that initially linked mine and Johnny's projects. Um, I've seen how the RISD Museum, which is both a fine arts museum and also an art school uh, museum, approaches conservation, and I'm eager to compare my experience there to the attitude in other museums. Um, I'm applying for mu museum jobs right now, and while my interest lies mostly in the fine arts, I would love to see how a different type of museum handles its collections. Uh, when I was talking to Chani yesterday and we were discussing our presentations, she happened to mention the Providence Children's Museum, which is apparently hiring. Um, and I was thinking about how that's probably the complete opposite of the RISD Museum um, in its approach to its objects. Um, objects are meant to be handled, are purposely not put on pedestals, and a conservator would have to act accordingly. Um, at any rate, I'm looking forward to seeing the principles of conservation in their various forms of execution <laughs> in the years to come. And thanks, guys. Well done, both of you. Um, I'm going to make just a few comments and offer up some general questions, and then I'll open it up to you guys in the audience. So I think both of these are really great uh, presentations and research projects. Um, I think while it ostensibly seems like they're very different projects, Chris and, Chris and yours is about um, artistic conservation and, and Sean and yours is about really education policy. Um, I think they do, to a great extent, speak to um, not just context broadly conceived, but historical contingency. Um, and I think Kirsten, um, you know, one of the questions I have relates to um, the way in which you guys confront um, history, particularly where you don't have access to mm -hmm. the original artist's intentions in the way that you did, for mm -hmm. example, with Brian Chippendale's work. So he's mm -hmm. alive, you knew what exactly. he wanted with respect to cleaning. Um, and I think the same thing applies to Shani. So um, I'll just pose these questions out there. I'll leave it to you guys to decide whether to answer those or to go directly to the audience for their more profound questions. Um, but I want to say first to Kirsten, you know, you 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 mentioned in particular, and, and you guys didn't hear that as much. But um, when she was cleaning um, Brian Chippendale's, which was the um, the large sculpture house shape thing, um, which I've actually seen at the museum, so I was um, glad to see that on display. Um, that you were able to consult with him about what he really wanted and what parts mm -hmm. should be cleaned or shouldn't be cleaned. He had some ideas about comfort levels with certain things being mm -hmm. allowed to decay. And it occurred to me that um, conservation almost implicitly assumes that art is supposed to be or worth preserving all the time in perpetuity. Mm -hmm. And is there ever any research that goes into the original artist's intent with respect to um, preservation, right? So do you, are there artists who might actually have wanted their, their work to decay over time, or who might not have expected their work to last mm -hmm. forever, to be sort of temporary objects? Mm -hmm. And then how do you confront those challenges? Um, I mean, I could even talk about, even within Brian Chippendale's work, um, it's a small thing, but the, if you've seen the piece, it has glass windows that have gotten really dirty over time, and people have drawn in the dirt, and he's, accepted that, that is like something, we've interviewed him and he specifically said, yes, I like that people participate in this. Um, but in terms of maybe older artists, I know there's definitely, I mean, you can do a certain amount of research into um, artist statements and that sort of thing. It gets harder the further you go back in right. history, obviously. Um, um, you mean they don't have Skype videos left for you? Or <laughs> no time travel. YouTube, <laughs> YouTube guides? Um, but I know there are definitely um, artist foundations that sort of advocate for the artist's intent with their pieces. Um, but yeah, we have, we have run into certain things where it's, we just have to talk to the curators about what they think would have been best for the piece. Um, so yeah. And so it's a reliance on those folks' expertise? Yeah, definitely. Okay. 
And, and my question for you, Shadi, is really a similar one. Um, obviously, the I think integral to what seems to be the um, current condition of education in the Virgin Islands is this extended experience with colonialism. Um, the most recent iteration is under the U.S., but you mentioned that there have been, you know, at least seven other um, colonizers uh, that have been involved. And I wonder to what extent, um, what particular role. Um, not just colonialism, but American colonialism has had on um, people's perceptions. You talked about wanting to do a sort of qualitative analysis, and you, and you talked a little bit about the numbers. Um, people, uh, there's a little bit of attrition, there's lower college matriculation, um, but based on the interviews that you did, um, how has that experience or has that experience um, figured into people's perceptions of what the challenges are and what the solutions are? Um. I think that it's interesting because there are a lot of things that sort of we don't talk about. Um, and it, it's this weird balance between um, people who are, you know, really interested in sort of pushing boundaries and pushing forward um, and, and sort of asking questions about our, the way that we, like, exist. Um, as Virgin Islanders. And then there are sort of other people who are totally like not interested in that at all um, and are sort of very much like stuck in the mud almost about like um, who they are and, and, and um, where they exist. So people who are okay with it um, or sort of don't really question it and then people who are really like this is not okay. Um, I think in terms of I mean, it's it's really it's really difficult to think about um, sort of the repercussions of being a colony when you think about. I, I was also a, a I did psychology um, before I was an education concentrator, so I'm almost a psychology concentrator as well. And so that was also something I was interested in: is what does it mean when you have this larger, infinitely more powerful in in a sort of economic um, in an economic sense hovering over you um, and determining like who you are and who you can be and what you can do. Um, and it's really, you know, discouraging, I think. Um, around the time when uh, my mother was working in the government, so in the late 80s, early 90s, um, the governor, uh, Governor Farrelly, was really interested in sort of building coalition between us and some of the other U.S. territories, so Guam, American Samoa, the Marshall Islands, Puerto Rico, and trying to figure out how to build coalition um, together and sort of move forward. Um, and that was totally destabilized. Um, and that can be really sort of discouraging. And, and there's almost, you know, there are pros and cons. It's not, you know, that everything is terrible. You do have, you know, sort of a safety blanket right. in that. Um, but then it's also weighing that against how much do you want to be able to self-determine? Um, because in, in the context of, of where we stand as, as being held by the Organic Act, um, we're not allowed to have relations with other countries except through the United States. And so if we were able to declare our independence, we would be hanging out until we could build like diplomatic relations with other countries. And so there are a lot of things that um, are really, you know, sort of mitigating um, our action in terms of that. And then of course, um, if you're thinking about education in the basic sense, you know, we take, we barely take civics, um, and, and Caribbean history, and so, Sounds you know. like the US. Yeah, so, <laughs> you know, there's not a lot of awareness over what can happen and what can be done. There's, so there's a lot of short-sightedness, um, which doesn't mean, you know, it's not an implication of, you know, the capability or intelligence of Virgin Islanders. They're highly capable and highly intelligent people, but you can only know what you've been exposed to. Um, and, and what's available. And so if, if these things aren't readily available in terms of ideas about um, self-determination and how you get there and how you do that and what the benefits are, um, then of course there's not gonna be you know, as much progress as there, there could be, okay. I think. Um, so context I think is really sort of important in that sense and, and um, you know, there's also a really interesting debate. You know, there are a lot of islands that have their independence now. Um, 
you know, and they're sort of looking at us and they're like, you guys are American, like, you know, you have it better than us, so why aren't you, you know, independent? Um, instead of like, like, what are you doing? Um, you know, and so it's really interesting to see um, over the, over the, you know, entirety of the Caribbean, countries that, you know, are independent, countries that aren't independent, countries that are colonies and, and um, what the repercussions are of gaining independence because, I mean, you could argue that a lot of the countries that are independent aren't doing very well. Absolutely. You know, um, because of, because once you're, once you're independent, that doesn't mean that, that like, colonization has gone away. There's still hundreds of years of repercussions. Yeah. Are there other questions for the panelists? Thank you, by the way, for your answers. Um, I have first of all, I love both your projects. I thought they were awesome. I think this is so cool to see all the stuff that's like coming out of 2012. This is you guys are both fantastic. Um, so a couple questions. The first one actually is for um, Kristen. So I think something that's interesting is how uh, objects travel from museum to museum and how they are acquired and sometimes dubiously acquired. And I was wondering if in your work at the museum you ever saw that come to play, either as a conservation issue in terms of things other museums had done or chosen to do that had to be undone, mm -hmm. or in how you present that object. Mm -hmm. um, You're talking about things that have been sort of dubiously acquired? So, yeah, so dubiously gotcha. acquired, or, or even who have just maybe gone through a complicated chain of ownership mm -hmm. and people have done. Um, I mean, I know in the ancient gallery we have, it's not exactly dubious, but right. it's, um, we, in the ancient gallery we have a lot of sculptures that have been restored in the 19th century where they've kind of taken some liberties with their, uh, and basically taken the uh, Munoz and Vinas approach. And um, they've, they've added noses, they've replaced limbs. And there's one um, sculpture that we have where um, it was repaired in the 19th century and badly repaired where the torso and the legs were separated um, originally and they put them back together. And now the Rusty Museum um, displays them next to each other but separate and has like a little blurb about it. So they sort of, they try to address it and I think it helps that it's a teaching institution that they're like very aware of that. Um, I can't think of anything where it's, it's certainly not the Getty where it's, <laughs> things are kind of coming from places they shouldn't be. Right. Um, but yeah. Do you, so just a quick follow up, do you ever now, does this change your perspective when you go to other museums? Do you ever like see something and go, they did a terrible job with that? Definitely. Like, I was actually, hate to hate on Duke right now, but um, I was at there at the Nasher recently, um, and just noticing their their ancient galleries, they had done a terrible job of, um, um, basically you have to mark everything with an acquisition number, um, but it's generally supposed to be hidden, and they just have it straight out there, and you can see everything, and they just, there isn't the level of, um, the appropriate level of treatment given to things, so definitely. It, it definitely heightens your awareness of how things are presented in the museum once you've worked there. Okay. Yeah. Other questions or comments? Just questions for both of you. Um, great job in your presentations. Um, one thing that came out in both of your presentations to me is the role of an intermediary. So whether that be a conservator or say, you know, one of the American teachers coming in. And I just kind of want to get both of your opinions on, you know, to what degree, you know, what role do those intermediaries play and to what degree should they be involved in the preservation of, you know, culture, history, narrative. Is I mean, I'm thinking about my own experience with museums. A lot of times they just make me angry because they're not really representing necessarily, you know, like my history and my narrative, the way that, you know, I experience it, or with teachers, you know, not hearing, you know, the history of my people until, you know, I can specialize it in college, just like you were saying, Shani. So I'm kind of wondering, you know, what can we do to make sure that, you know, whether it be, you know, what would it take for it to be appropriate for, you know, a foreign teacher to come into the Virgin Islands, or what does a conservator need to know to preserve those histories and narratives? Um, it's really interesting she asked. So something that um, that my mom does, she's a, she's a consultant and self-employed, but part of, um, like, this whole set of trainings that she does is one for new 
um, new residents, um, people who are going to be working in public service um, or places where they have to deal with community members a lot. Um, and you know, it involves sort of an awareness of who you are and where you're coming from and respecting that, but also understanding how that fits into this new context of where you're coming into. It's kind of like um, the idea of allyship that if you know, it doesn't mean that you don't have a space in that narrative, but it means that you have to come in with respect for that narrative um, and, and give it um, the proper sort of treatment um, that it requires. So, you know, coming in and, and um, respecting language and trying to learn um, and trying to see how these things are similar, how they're parallel. One of the exercises that she does is um, taking idioms from different cultures and sort of bringing them together and being like, well, this is how we say this here and this is how we say this there and, and sort of trying to bring that together and bring people together to understand um, that difference doesn't necessarily mean inequality, um, but there is sort of um, an underlying like hierarchical structure in terms of identity, I think, especially you know in the U.S. and, and its holdings. Um, and so I think you know it's really important that yeah, lots of people be involved, but that they be involved in a way that's constructive, um, and that gives um, whatever the primary you know group or subject um, is the proper respect and proper care. When you say a hierarchy of identities, what do you mean? So, for instance, um, I mean, if you think about um, class or race, so a lot of times we get a lot of like middle class, young, like white people who come in and like just don't have any sort of idea of where they're coming to. They just sort of think, oh, we're going on vacation, it's going to be great. Um, <laughs> and, you know, and, and, they're not, they're not bad people, but they also like, don't have any awareness of, you're coming into a place that has a totally different history and a totally different culture and a set of norms and standards um, and language, and you can't just come and be like, I'm gonna do whatever I want. Um, you have to have respect for that and have to take care um, coming in because you are in a whole other kind of place and you have to respect that place. Um, it's like being a guest in someone's home. Um, you've mentioned a lot self-determination and, and the role that that plays possibly as a policy solution. And it made me wonder to what extent historically there's been a move for um, self-determination as opposed to, say, statehood. Okay. Um, this has obviously been an issue of tension for Puerto right. Rico for years, right. um, and they've continually opted to sustain this essentially middle ground between statehood and, right. and full independence. Has there been a similar kind of approach to self-determination in the U.S. Virgin Islands? Yeah. Um, Puerto Rico is an interesting um, sort of example because they're Spanish-speaking. Right. Um, and so they can, like, do a lot of other things in 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 um, the sense of like their history and context and like language and things like that. It's interesting. Uh, there's a whole sort of um, sort of dialogue about like what it means that that it's a Spanish-speaking culture. Um, but in terms of the Virgin Islands and what we've tried to do, like I mentioned earlier, um, Governor Farrelly back in in the late 80s, early 90s, really tried to build coalition with some of the other um, territories and and try and figure out what the steps would be toward independence. Um, I think the idea that's generally been accepted is that you can't just go cold into we're going to be our own self-sustaining country um, because there are a lot of limitations there in terms of can we self-sustain? Um, do we have enough interest, industry and economic structure to be able to um, take care of ourselves and take care of our people? 30% um, of people live before, below the poverty line. And so how is that you know, statistic going to be affected once we're independent. Um, so, so far, what has happened is there's been a number of constitutional conventions um, of people coming together and trying to form our own constitution. Right now, our sort of governing document is the Organic Act. Um, and so trying to build something that um, is something that we wrote something that, that we determined and, and agreed upon. Um, and you know, there have been a lot of you know, sort of struggles, legal struggles in terms of, of figuring that out and trying to get it passed and things like that. Um, but I think that's sort of the first step. And once you know, we can figure out um, and agree on what that constitution should entail, then you, know, you can take the next steps in terms of independence. Um, 
you know, but independence comes in in lots of different ways. You know, it can come in in you know revolution the way it happened in Haiti. You know, they were just like, we're not doing this anymore. Um, we're going to have a revolution, and, and sort of the way that that happened versus you know other countries that um, you know sort of had. Uh, dialogue with you know mother country and and figuring out how to be independent that way. So there are a lot of different ways in, to determine or, or gain independence. But I think um, thus far the probably the most um, interesting um, and and probably useful uh, path has been to try and build this constitution and then figure out what happens next um, after that. Um, yeah, so in the museum, <laughs> um, I actually totally agree with you that um, oftentimes it's, it's, the museum is inherently biased and no one really realizes that because things are presented as self-evident and that's just not true. Um, I think there are moves being made to um, create more awareness that the, what's presented in the museum isn't just fact, it's it's, a, it's an interpretation. Um, and I think actually Applebaum kind of gets at that in her theory of conservation. Um, and like specifically in conservation, I can think of an example at the Getty Museum. They had a small exhibit where they, they actually highlighted the, um, the process they had gone through of conserving a certain piece. So you were very much aware that it had been interfered with in some way. Um, in terms of actual cultures, I think it's in like respecting the original culture and really representing it faithfully. Um, I think it's, I think just you have to really re do research. Um, and I think the collaboration of curators with conservators, just like getting as many like helpful perspectives as possible, I think that's really all you can do. Um, yeah, we're, we're trying. <laughs> So how present should the museum be in its display then? Because mm -hmm. it's probably, I, I imagine it's somewhat of a balance between trying to explain their role and their interpretation and also have something that people will still read sort of walking that's by. A, that's always an issue, Quickly. but you, can, you can't have, there's like a limit to how long you can make those little captions. Um, I mean, I think having certain like, like, like the Getty did with this small exhibit, which probably not everybody saw. Um, it's easy to miss. Um, but I think just like attempting to bring that awareness out, and it's going to be a process. And I think with new museums and like new forms of art, I think that's, that's something that's coming. Do you think observers are concerned about those kinds of processes? In other words, is it, you know, am, am I a viewer going to care? Right. I mean, I think it depends on your interests. The extent to which you've been faithful to the original. Yeah. I think it depends on your interests. Um, like a casual observer might not necessarily care that, oh, like, this part was repaired, um, or this part was an original. Um, I think, yeah, it, it's a tough, it's a tough line to cross, um, but, yeah. So how did you balance it when you were doing the, the work yourself? Were you, where were you on that spectrum of objectivity and subjectivity? I mean, because I'm working for Ingrid, I'm probably also falling somewhere in the middle. I think the being too subjective is dangerous, because then you're just, yeah, you're, you're becoming the author of the object, and while that's nice, like you need to, ultimately you kind of have to have uh, less of an ego when you're a conservator, I find a lot. Um, you have to admit that you're uh, working on somebody else's object, even if that person isn't still alive, um, mm. and you have to respect that. Um, but I also think that the being too objective and too scared to do anything, I think that's also a bad idea, so yeah. I have a question uh, for Shawnee um, about kind of how um, the uses of education are kind of perceived or um, like what are the different imperatives behind that? I know you mentioned there's like this large kind of like passes there, like this large, you know, kind of um, economic, in some ways some type of supposedly economic development mm -hmm. there, but how much is that actually a part of the you know, of um, St. Croix's economy and right. like, and how are people thinking about what do I need to be educated for? Am I going to like, right. like, am I coming back? Do I need, because I know you mentioned something about like the high school rates being yeah. very, very low mm -hmm. and um, higher education opportunities being very low too. Mm -hmm. So, if you could just. Yeah, um, so it's interesting. Actually, uh, something that I, I didn't mention is that 
has actually just closed. Um, the refinery just closed last Friday. So that put about 2,000 people out of work, um, which is, it's actually, a, it's a really huge deal. Um, because despite um, sort of, there are, there are economic development, like policies and startup policies. So um, for the, if you're gonna be sort of an economic development company, um, for the first five years of your existence, um, you get a 90% tax break so that you can sort of build up your capital and, and um, sort of become sustainable. And then after that, it's, you're supposed to raise your taxes so that you can give back to the community that has given you a break. Um, that never happened. So exa Hess existed from 1965 until now with a 90% tax break. Um, so, but it did still bring a lot into the economy. Um, it did still employ a lot of people, and so it's a really um, interesting like balance um, that, I mean, doesn't exist anymore. But in terms of, of education, um, in, in, with public education, um, there is a vocational school. Um, there's also, there, so there are two public high schools that are academic, um, and then one of them also has a vocational side. Um, the private and parochial schools are all geared towards college preparatory work, um, but it depends on school to school, like how many people go to college. So um, for instance, for me, like 100% of my class went to college, but um, you know, in some other schools, the level may be more around like 50%. Um, it's, it's difficult to sort of determine that. Back in the day, so back in like the 60s and 50s, um, St. Croix was an agrarian society. So a lot of people, students went to school. Um, they also worked on their family's farms. Um, and so there was going to school, um, and, and they had other professions. A lot of people were teachers and, and craftspeople, um, but then they also had their own farms and things like that. So there were sort of two levels of sort of career employment um, that people could engage in. Um, and it was, you know, sort of stable in that, you know, not a lot of people were really trying to like climb the social ladder because it was more level. Um, but as time went on, there became increased sort of class stratification and sort of um, an idea of like what sort of standard of living you should have. Um, so in terms of, of goals of education, I think like a lot of young people are really interested in being able to um, sort of support themselves and a lot of them really have like dreams of things that they want to do in terms of um, you know owning businesses or having careers and things like that. I think the struggle is that um, there's not enough like support in terms of, of educational preparation for that and there's also sort of uh, not enough of a community support or community like caring around that. Um, so you know people do get some support but I think there's not as much um, cohesive support as there could be. So in terms of thinking about what I said I, I hope my goals of education should be, um, I sort of see it as um, a foundational support. So upon graduating high school, a student should be able to, if they want to go to college, they should be able to go to college. If they want to do skilled labor, if they want to um, you know, start their own business, they should have the wherewithal to be able to do that. They should have options. Um, education should you know, allow you to open up and have freedom to do whatever it is that you would like to do. It shouldn't be something that holds you back. Um, so, you know, that's what, that's what I'm sort of thinking about in terms of education. Thinking about, you know, the type of work that a lot of people engage in. Um, there are very, there's a very small amount of people who are um, sort of professionals um, in their field. So, you know, doctors, lawyers, um, you know, people who are makes A lot of, a lot of uh, work is usually um, sort of median level work. So working in the government in offices or working in the bank as tellers, um, working in stores and shops and things like that. Um, it's very difficult and there's a very small amount of the population that does sort of that like um, governing or higher level um, work. And a lot of those people are not Native Virgin Islanders. They're people who come and are able to sort of succeed with that. So what I'd like to see um, is, you know, A, having respect for people working at all different levels. Um, because um, all of those different things have value and a society couldn't s exist without them. Um, but I would also like to see in um, sort of 
the higher level positions, if you're talking about government, if you're talking about um, planning and policy and things like that, I would like to see more young Native Virgin Islanders doing those jobs as opposed to other people coming in and doing it for them. Um, so I would, I want to wrap up with one final question to both of you, um, which I think is um, a function of a theme that you've both, to some extent, spoken to, or at least your projects speak to, which is the, I think in some ways, unique opportunities that you're afforded as a Brown student. Right? Shani, you talked about um, having the impetus for this project having been a course you took freshman year here that might not have been available to you um, even in the Virgin Islands. Um, and Kirsten, you talked about, you, you know, your internship was at RISD when, and was almost certainly a function of the relationship between Brown and RISD. And so I wonder um, if these projects have given you an opportunity to reflect at greater length on your own um, agency, your own identity, your own privilege, perhaps. Um, and if so, what you, what you made of that reflection so far? Because I hope it's something you can do. Okay. Um, actually, this is something that, you know, I think about a lot. There's this um, idea of, you know, there's a sort of a, an awe with American culture and, and what it means to be American um, and, and sort of like what we see on TV and, and, you know, the people who come and visit and like the tourists and what sort of lives that we perceive that they live and what we perceive it means to be um, American, um, but then there's this also this like sort of pushback um, and sort of trying to hold on to like a solid identity of what it means to be a Virgin Islander. And I think in um, what happens in a lot of places, what happens to a lot of uh, students who go away is that um, you know they go away and and. Um, you know, they have these plans like, I, you know, I came to college and I had these plans about, you know, what I wanted to do and, and what I wanted to learn to take home. Um, and when you go back, there's almost a mistrust that you've been gone too long um, and you're coming back with all these new ideas and who do you think you are? Um, that you, you've gone away and like brought back all these things in and now you think you're better than us and you want to change all these things. Why aren't we good enough the way we are? Um, and so there's like a, a misunderstanding there. Um, and so, yes, I am, you know, coming from um, a place of, of privilege, I mean educational privilege in, in that I was able to attend Brown and able to be exposed to you know, all these ideas and possibilities and, and being able to apply sort of my life and experience in my community to what I was learning. Um, and sort of, you know, bringing that back and, and trying to figure out how to navigate that. And, um, you know, in the same way I talked about, you know, coming in and respecting, like, how do I go back and respect that, um, you know, and, and approach it in such a way that, you know, it's not like I'm coming in and saying, oh, well, I went away and I learned all these things and we're not good enough and we need to change everything. It's that, no, I learned about all the possibilities that we can be in the ways in which we can use who we are um, to be better. Um, and so it's going to be, you know, thinking about a lot about respect, a lot about privilege, um, a lot about, uh, you know, gradual and sort of trying to meet people where they are, um, you know, and, and, and bringing in examples. Um, and yeah, I think, I think it's a lot of, it's definitely a lot of that. Um, it's not going to be like easy. Um, change doesn't happen like overnight and it doesn't happen with one person. Um, yeah. And same question, Kirsten, how yeah. confident do you feel now about being able to go out and do this kind of stuff independently, having had the experience with, or the engagement with the theory and the experience, the practical mm -hmm. experience you've had at the RIS Museum. Right. I mean, I'll say that I, I think I was incredibly lucky that I happened to come to Brown and happened to be at a college that has this relationship with RISD, which the RISD Museum is basically Providence's major art museum, and like that's huge that I got to intern there. Um, and I, I will be interested to see that, I mean, like I said, I'm applying for museum jobs right now at like major institutions um, in New York and LA. Um, and I'll be interested to see if, whether they take me seriously, I guess. Um, um, because clearly, like, I mean, I've done this project, but I have, I've only had experience in one museum. Um, and like my understanding of theory, while well, I feel like I've found a sort of comprehensive spectrum, um, I don't think it's, it's not like I've been to grad school. Um, and I'll be interested to, yeah, I'll be interested to see um, how people respond to my experience. 
Um, there was something else I was going to say, and I can't remember what it was. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I think even just a different museum would be cool to see. Well, thank you again for great presentations, great research, and thank you all for your questions. Um, and best of luck with whatever you do afterwards. Thank you. Thank you.